All righty, ladies and gentlemen, our automotive enthusiast friends, brethren, and sisterin. Is that a term? <laughs> sisterin? <laughs> sure. Sis- sisters from uh, all over the great big planet Earth. You've done it once again. You uh, may have tried to resist, and yet you still hit the play button on yet another. Kevin, another legendary episode of V8 Radio. Ooh, legendary. Hmm. The stuff of legends. I kind of, I think I know where hey. this is going. Exactly. I'm glad you picked up on that. Right on. Well, this is the V8 Radio podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined as always by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball clark And I'm damn glad to be here. That was Mike Clark, and he was damn glad to meet you. <laughs> exactly. And... <laughs> <laughs> and uh for those who are longtime listeners this is uh it's becoming old hat you know what's going to happen you you can call the shot before it even happens here that's right we start every <laughs> single episode of the v8 radio podcast off with an automotive trivia question and we kind of volley these to each other in the beginning uh withholding the answers until the very end oh, so so you, devious in fact prepared a trivia question absolutely sir and away we go so kevin uh when chrysler uh debuted uh electric uh, cruise control in 1958 what did they call it oh wow that is a great great question love it because <laughs> all those automakers had all kinds of fun names for all of their features mm-hmm. and uh you know, in fact, just the other day, I was inventing features that never existed, or at least names really? for features. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of jazzed up about uh, about some projects that I would like to do, uh, cars that we'd like to build, and you know, at the V8 Speed and Resto Shop. And you know, today you can build a car, but I think it's it's more fun if the car has a little bit deeper of a story, you know, a little bit more meaning perhaps. And I know, you know, our friend Steve Strope always likes to invent some kind of a backstory for the cars that he's working on. And and, and in that case, it's a little bit different than what I'm thinking of because he likes to come up with a persona of who, who would have uh, owned this car, built the car, right? Okay. Um, what I kind of like to do is just kind of rewrite a little fictional history around things that were done to the car and the specific example i was talking about is a uh, i got this idea for a 58 either edsel or mercury wagon and i know we've talked about this before mm-hmm. but um i'm just I, I geek out over all those 50s <laughs> americana advertising names for everything sure um similar to the desk that i have in my office the deskomatic you know oh yeah uh, the deskomatic so too that's right uh, but I was imagining this wagon on a cross country trip and you'd pull over and, and open the tailgate and, uh, access the picnic kit, which would have Ooh. a dash, you know, the picnic dash kit, um, in a color matched cooler and, and thermoses, you know, to the car. And, uh, Very of nice. course your, uh, your journey would be made. Nice and easy because of the uh, the Super Highway Star 430 V8 that would be spinning the Transcon Overdrive. You know? <laughs> this is the, this is the junk that I make up in my head. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if we build this car, those will happen. By the way, all right, uh, <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> there was uh, a couple others that I, I uh, was thinking about on that on that same project car. Um, Future view headlights. Ooh. Why did they never call headlights? You know, that's a, such a perfect... I, I can just imagine the 1959 Cadillac with future view headlights. Oh, man. See, see down the road into the future. I want that Cadillac. I know. Or uh, instead of, uh, you know, your regular dome light, it has a polar dome. Oh, nice. And uh, AccuSafe steering or Confistop brakes. Confiscate. You like that? If you don't stop, you'll have you'll they'll confiscate your license. Yeah, well, but it would also have a star bright stoplights. Mm. Yeah, man, so, dude, I, you were born too late. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> you should have been born in the 30s. So when you were in your 20s or 30s, you would have been coming up with these and you would have been in your prime and sure. people would still be talking about you today. Instead, I'm just kind of a dork. Instead, you're just, you're, well, you're, you're, you're very imaginative. Yeah. Well, the problem is I can't, I can't imagine what Chrysler called the uh, electric cruise control oh, at this point. Oh, here it comes, full circle. You know, because some of the actual things were like the Autronic Eye, which was the auto dimming right. headlights, you know, and the, uh, there was a, uh, a Cruise Master, I think was one of the names, um, uh, Command Drive was something. So I don't know. Uh, what year were we talking? 1958. 58. I will give you a kind of a hint, and the the term cruise control actually came from Cadillac, and it just right. kind of happened to start sticking in industry wide. It's like a Xerox, right? Exactly, or Kleenex and Scotch tape, all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm just gonna go with uh, with throttle command. Throttle command. I like it that. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere, man. I don't know. It could be all. It could could have highway or road command or you know road guide. Any number of things that I don't know the actual answer to. <laughs> right on. <laughs> well, if it's any of those things with the word command in it, we'll give it to you. How about that? Oh, right on. Well, I know That's Chrysler. A big if. You know, that was uh, they they had the word the three eighty three was the the super commando super commando point. yeah. Yeah, that's where I kind of connected that. But uh-huh. so you know, at the end of the episode, if you want a really killer '58 Mercury wagon with a bunch of fictional accessories, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to build it for you. Yes, the future view headlights—that's a thing. Uh-huh. All right. Well, good luck to me on that. Um, <laughs> And we'll find out. I've got the show one. If you're correct. Yes. Well, I got one for you, which I think you're gonna you're gonna get it instantly. Uh, mm, okay. This one I'm confident of. I've heard this one before. Yeah. So who was a different kind of car company with a different kind of car? Ooh. A <laughs> different kind of car company with a different kind of car. Well. You know you're a, you're a big fan of astronomy, right? And uh, outer space. <laughs> and I pulled this out of my anus. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just talking so, about a Mercury. So, <laughs> yeah, true, true. Yes, you were. Oh boy! So with a different kind of car and a different kind of company. That would you'd certainly need uh, to have some interesting features in your car. Maybe like. I don't know composite body panels and um, ooh, could be different. Yeah, and uh, those Fieros and had everything. Those Fieros did have everything, but we're not <laughs> talking those, about Pontiac here. And those Corvettes. <laughs> listen, listen. I'm trying to answer here. <laughs> Car's not so different after all. <laughs> no, apparently not. Which is why they're not not around anymore. Okay, different kind of car, different kind of company. Was our good friends at Saturn. Ooh, are you sure? I mean, it seems like that could be the obvious choice. It does seem like it could be the obvious choice. So I'm not. I'm not going to let you talk me out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Which what is what you, you do. <laughs> no, uh-uh. <laughs> you just you just got to <laughs> turn over all the rocks, you know, and yeah. make sure. <laughs> <laughs> kick all the rocks yeah pound all the sand is what you're trying to tell <laughs> yeah uh, uh, all right well so if final, your final answer. answer is saturn it is duly noted and we'll find out at the end of the episode right on so there you go so, so i'll admit that um you know i'm a little halfway out of sorts here just because there's been so much going on with uh Events and travel and the shop and all the rest of the stuff. It's crazy. It is crazy. We've we've both been a, a little busy. Yeah, yeah. You're you're in it to win it now, so that's good. I, I definitely am. I'm I'm a real I'm really in it. I'm neck deep, which which is great. I love it. You know what's funny so. is ever since uh, you became gainfully employed 
for reals at the V8 Speed and Resto shop. I don't hear you say I'm an industry guy that much anymore. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> the honeymoon phase is over. <laughs> Working stiff again. That's right. I'm really doing it. Like, ah, oh, man. <laughs> uh, but no, no. But that's all good stuff. Full on legit industry guy. So we just got back hey, from the SEMA show, which uh, is um, is a thing, and it didn't let down. Um, it did not. What was my uh, feet nearly let me down, but uh, the show did not let me down. Did you happen to log steps by any chance? Uh, Brian did, and we were kicking around between fifteen to twenty thousand steps per day. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, it felt bad. Uh, but uh, I guess it's not bad. Yeah, after day three or four, it starts to Holy add up. cats. My feet hurt for three days afterward, too. And it was so worth it. It 100%. I mean, yeah. it, no part of that is me complaining. But um, n- n- No. I'm it, still it, working out. It was, it was great. I'm still working off my, uh, my crash from Monday, the yes. first day of the show, when I stepped out of an Uber and tripped over a curb and landed oh, square yeah. on my left knee. Oh, and man. Wipe out. Swelled, swelled up to be a, the size of a grapefruit, and I ripped my pants, and it was bleeding and everything. And, uh, oh, gee. you know, the show must go on, so there, there was no, you know, there's no calling in sick for that one, for sure. No. So, no you had stuff to do. I did, and I, I did what you shouldn't do, and that's basically stand and walk on that knee all day for a week. And then Kelly and I went hiking in Zion National Park, and... <laughs> <laughs> nice not once did i really give this knee much of a break but uh at least it wasn't broken it was just annoyed and it's uh it's getting better so good good i mean compound that on top of the the post sema flu and boy you really you're really in it then oh yeah 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 i had that and yeah uh, so did you, i you had I some of that too brian right? yeah. did too a little bit yeah yeah mine's it's hard much to gone. Yeah, mine too. But you know, you're. It's hard to come out unscathed when you're in a room full of 160 thousand of your you know, of your closest friends. So that's right. These are all very tiny, you know, prices to pay, if you will, because the show True. was unbelievable. And I, you know, I hate to start off like sounding like we're griping about it, but I look at these <laughs> as, you know, just kind of funny war stories of of the things that uh, I would gladly do. Every, I'd, I'd crash every day just to be part of that show. Yes, it was so I would too. so nice. So yeah, it, this it was, was super cool. Your your third, yes, yeah, third SEMA, and the longest time you've ever spent at the show. Yes, definitely think, right. M- most of the week, anyway. Yeah, I was here what uh, Tuesday? No, Monday, Monday through Friday. I left Friday. Yeah, the whole whole time. Yeah, there the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. So what was Holy your, uh, did you, yeah, <laughs> did you have <laughs> wow. any uh, big SEMA moments, any big takeaways, any, uh, what, what was your take? And it's funny, when people ask you that, by the way, it's impossible to answer that question because there's it's, so many different dimensions. It's difficult. Uh, my, my biggest takeaway is, you know, being my third SEMA, this was the first time, th- it was a different type of show for me this time. The first two times I was there, uh, as a, you know, a V8 radio, uh, media person. And I was getting interviews from people like, you know, our good friend Rick Love from Vintage Air and uh, Chris Rashke from, uh, APR, ARP rather. Excuse me. Sorry, Chris. And, um, but this time I was trying to foster relationships with our vendors that we use and trying to meet new people and forge new relationships for, with, uh, companies that may be able to, we may be able to partner with uh, to build these cars that we do. So it was a, I, I felt a little, um, you know, off balance a little bit, but uh, by the end of the show, it, I felt a lot better. And um, it was, I mean, it was tremendous for me just doing a whole new thing for real this time. I mean, this is my mm-hmm. job now, not, not, not a, you know, a vacation sort of, so to speak. Sure. Sure. Well, and I think it, it's cool that you, you know, you've now had two different perspectives of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I will say that the current capacity, you're much closer to the action because now, you know, you're, you're a buyer. 
you know, you're talking right. to people about buying their parts, and now everybody wants to talk to you. <laughs> uh-huh. That's a different deal than than just shooting the breeze and recording it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I met uh, a lot of people who were really interested in telling me about the, the products they have, and so, some were pretty cool. Some were not something that we that we're into, but we're interesting nonetheless. So. Yeah, and what you find is that. Uh, you know, you hear the six degrees of separation. That that's the auto industry. That's the whole aftermarket. So mm-hmm. even if some person is marketing, you know, a seatbelt for a golf cart or something, you know, that seems like way far removed, uh, a short conversation will reveal that they, you know, maybe they have a sideline that does race car harnesses, you know, ah, true. or. Or they used to work somewhere else that you deal with now. I mean, it's really amazing how interwoven the whole industry really is. It's a lot smaller than you would think, even though it's enormous. Right. Yeah, that's that's 100% true. And when I, I was tagging along with Brian a little bit on one of the days, just to kind of watch his technique and try to learn from him. And Brian I'll Wibbenmeyer, tell you what. our ace, ace parts guy, by the way. Ace parts guy. My goodness, this <laughs> guy. He he could talk to a rock, and a rock would want to do business with him. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this guy, he's just got the gift. He really, really does. He's amazing. And I, I'll, mm-hmm. I tell him that all the damn time. He's just unreal. Well, so, what's th- uh, a, a huge asset, obviously, his personality and his communication ability but he lives this stuff he's on drag yes. week and he's he's racing the car and building cars with his brother and everything and and uh, mm-hmm. so he's got firsthand experience um that a lot of people don't and it comes across instantly it does it really does he knows what he's talking about he i mean he lives it he's been to he spent a 12 events this year he told me yeah and he just he just does it, man. He just goes for it. It's great. Mm-hmm. It's it's really inspiring, to, to, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, it to, is. To really be more involved with, with what we have going on here. So, I mean, I, I, before I started working here, I, my my toe was barely dipped into the water. But now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm way steep now, and I'm, I'm ready to go, you know, fully under. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm ready to sink, baby. That's right, man. I'm ready to dive in is what I'm ready to do. There you go. I'm I'm capsizing. <laughs> you know I'm what going I meant. Under. Yeah. I know what you meant, but it's like... Yeah, I great. know. Poor choice of analogy words. line that you went down there is funny because, yeah. as you know, sometimes it feels like that. You're yeah, taking well, on water yeah. and it's like, oh, man. Yeah. I'm in the weeds. Ah. Yeah. But at least it's something that is, you know, interesting that you don't mind getting in the weeds for because there's a problem to solve there and somebody mm-hmm. is willing to help. And there you go. So yes. um, as you were navigating the show and and chatting with people what was the what was your take on the reaction and and those type of communications that you had with people when you started telling them that you were with v8 speed and resto and you you know we're building these cars and stuff how did people receive all that oh they receive it very well i mean they're they're interested to know what kind of cars we typically build you know where we want to be um how their company could benefit us how we can you know benefit each other um, and you know they're really interested to 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 work something out and and you know learn more about it and you know they, they scan your badge or you give them a card you get one in return you try to stay in contact and uh, and it's it's a it's a kind of, it's a pretty neat deal yeah yeah that's good nobody you know said f you and turned and ran no no not even <laughs> close I mean everybody was super cool. Yeah, and, and generally that's how it is um, in the industry. I was spoiled at my first SEMA show because it was the Hot Rod Magazine 50th anniversary celebration Ooh. year, and I I had a Hot Rod shirt on, and everybody wanted to be in the magazine, and everybody was all you know it was high energy and very exciting. Yeah, and you know that was my expectation of how that show was going to be all the time, and and actually it's not far off. That's kind of how it is. So it's cool. Yes, there is a, quite a bit of energy going on through that through that place, you know, 
in the convention center and outside and you know people that you see in the hotel that you know are at the SEMA show or they're they're all the buzz and they're talking about things and you know it goes beyond the the halls of the convention center so it's everywhere yeah yeah <clears throat> so from a um a product standpoint did you see anything that you thought hey this is something that uh, is a, a step forward something that's pretty pretty new and cool and interesting um yes um is, and and you and you know about this but um our new best friends at a company called saltworks they yeah. have a metal forming uh machine that can reproduce you 3d scan a part and they can reproduce the sheet metal uh, of that part like a fender or door skin um whatever with with cnc tolerances and for us that could be a really a real game changer as we know that a lot of the aftermarket sheet metal maybe not a lot but some of this aftermarket sheet metal is just not quite up to our standards and it requires a lot more working to make things fit and that's time and that's money and if we can have a part created to our specs that's going to fit immediately well we're we're way ahead of the game and if we have a file of that part we can have it made on demand and when we need to and just have it when we need to have it and and i think that if we can get everything in line with this it's going to be a huge game changer for the v8 speed and resto shop yeah and i'm i'm way ahead of you on that one because that that technology is pivotal um 100%. and for what you described and even even in the custom side even more i think mm -hmm. so since since the show I've uh, I fully capsized and submerged myself in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I went okay. waist deep and then neck deep and, and then all I'm, the way under. I'm way under. I'm baptized. And, I'm fully baptized. Oh yes, yeah. I'm a believer. So <laughs> my uh, in my youth, I I took a lot of drafting classes and and design classes, and I was an early adopter of of CAD software before it was really a thing. Mm -hmm. When it was just like kind of a novelty, you know, and I, I many times in my life, and I'm not saying that I'm I'm anything special, but my timing has been off in the sense that I've been an early adopter of a lot of things before a practical application has been around. OK, so mm. in this example, I was like all about the CAD and, and designing stuff, but then I couldn't do anything with with that after the design right. to, to take it from the screen to a part or a product was mm -hmm. beyond the reach. Okay. Sure. And so I kind of cooled off and I, and I did a lot of 3d work for, for graphics, for visual work, for animations and stuff and video and things like that. And, and that's cool, but it's not, it doesn't have the same payoff of, you know, building a step file that creates a, a machined part or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And most of that stuff is for machine parts like we're talking about like like gears and wheels and blocks and, sure and cylinder head uh you know airflow mm -hmm. improvements and making hard parts but now we're talking about sheet metal yeah and man. so to take an on-screen an on-screen design and have the machine create the panel not that we can't do that already in house, but to be able to do it far faster with accuracy and repeatability. Yes, that's the key. Is, yes, and then I was kind of stuck because it's like, okay, well, I got out of the CAD thing, and I'm not up to speed on the latest software and the methodology, wow. and you know how are we going to get there? And Kelly had talked to some people, and you did, and I did, and you know to try it out, I didn't necessarily want to invest twenty grand into a scanner and. Right. however much and everything else. But I envision this workflow where it's like, if we have a car in the shop, you know, if we bring a 49 Buick in or something, uh -huh. that that replacement new parts, sheet metal doesn't exist. Right. And, and, and we've got a fender that's got a smash in it. You know, it's all bent up or something. We can scan that and fix the dent on screen. Yes. And or... Let's do something custom. Let's change the body line or put in a mm -hmm. vent or roll the lip or make a wide body or whatever, and then send that to the essentially the job shop who can 
create the actual part, send it back to us, mm-hmm. and now it goes on the car that it was designed for. So your fit factor is a lot tighter, right? Yes. So right after the show, I, I really dove into the manipulation software, but also the scanning concept. And um, I've I've been successful. I don't know if we talked about this. No. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I scanned because the whole I've been t- I was tasked with looking up 3D scanners. Oh, yeah. No, I'm ahead of you. Ah, so, uh, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> I've uh, successfully uh, <laughs> scanned the uh, the 57 ranch wagon front end that we were working on. Uh, I scanned the uh, firewall of that 71 or the 70 Chevelle that's in the fab shop that we did a, a flat panel in. Um, I scanned that whole floor to modify for a bigger trans tunnel for a, a chassis. And a really? different transmission, yeah. And and the process that I'm using is called photogrammetry. And it takes photos and stitches oh. them together and builds a mesh, 3D mesh model. Okay. And then from there, you can convert the mesh into an object to which software like Fusion 365 can open and manipulate, and then it can export it as a step file that's readable by a CNC machine. So, Dang. oh yeah, yeah. So I had an hour call with the Fusion guys today about uh, workflows, and nice, yeah. And 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 we're gonna get there. It's not. I mean, we're we're so close right now. I mean, I, I fully grasp all the pieces of the puzzle and the workflow. Um, it's just a matter of running it through the process. And have it actually, you know, come come to life is right. The best way to say it: get a, a, an actual part in hand and see how it fits and how it works. Right, because the the hurdles become the nuances of the software, and mm-hmm. of course the licenses and you know learning the navigation right. of how to use all the software. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I equate myself to Jeff Lynn from ELO, you know, because. Jeff Lynn doesn't know how to read music, but conducts the electric light orchestra. Oh, so he can hear it. He knows what he wants. You know, he sure. relies on the musicians to play the notes and to write the scores. Gotcha. So I see it. It's there. Right on. Um, we're just honing in on it. The thing that really also turns me on about this is not not just the not just the accuracy and the repeatability, but the actual metal itself we can spec to what we want as far as thickness is concerned and, and metal type because these offshore parts, the offshore fenders or offshore hoods, you know, the metal just may not be up to snuff. It may be a little too thin for us. It may be a little, you know, the integrity isn't there. So we can get something that we want to spec that's a little more OEM compliant, so to speak, and is a better quality part all around, not just in, you know, size and shape, but in also thickness. Yeah. And I will say at this point that we, I think we are speaking out of school a little bit. Um, cause I, I had a big conversation with Michael Gray over at AMD a couple of years ago mm-hmm. about this very topic and, and how the, the mit, or the word on the street was that, you know, these offshore reproduction fenders and hoods and stuff were made of a thinner gauge or a lesser quality mm. steel, and they weren't as good. And the reality is they're not. They're, oh, they're, really? Yeah, they're, they're mostly all made from the exact same gauge of steel and, and certainly the same strength. But steel is different today than it was 40, 50 years ago. Mm. So the alloy uh, composition itself is a little bit different. And certainly the welds are different. So back, you know, if you, if you pop the hood on your, your GTO in your garage, you will see compression spot welds that look like somebody took a, took a hot thumb and mushed the two panels (laughs) together, right? right? It's got a nice dent, you know, indentation Mm -hmm. and the melt. And then today's panels are these tiny little weld where it's a very precise circle and it's just a little, you know, Mm, I I see. And they may have, nearly equal strength but the technology to weld today is different from what it was and a lot of that is because the old welder overdid it you know it it put too much heat in and it used too much power so in an attempt to make the factories more efficient they give it what it needs and not anymore but then okay when we look at it as a restore you can tell right away oh it's a gm hood and this is one from 
company X because right. you can just tell tell by the weld structure. Sure. So there, there's all this stuff, and and again, I'm not sure that it's going to be in our best interest to, at least not in the beginning, to just say, hey, we're going to scan and fix this fender and then and have a new fender skin made and install that mm-hmm. when we can buy one for 200 bucks. Sure. Um, and because like all new emerging technologies, it's going to be expensive in the beginning. Right. And then over time, it's going to reduce. And I don't know what some of the cost models are at this point. Um, I was told that one of the machines they're going to, they're going to be charging by the, by the minute basically to use it. That's how they're going to build these things out. However long Oof. it takes to make the part. And, but the, the machines work pretty quick, you know, and, and if they can kick out a, a fender skin in 20 minutes or, you know, 35 minutes or something, uh-huh. and they charge 50 bucks a minute or something, but it's a really good fit and it, it has something that we added to the design that would have taken uh-huh. us 10 hours to make. Sure. It's totally worth it, you know? Uh-huh. So you really have to analyze the end to end cost structure of concept design uh-huh. manipulation send ship material return right. and then install as opposed to taking it out of the box and putting it on but uh what right. i think is you know r- really cool is that we're seeing all these technologies reach you know smaller businesses that couldn't afford the machine or just it didn't exist before uh-huh. uh but you still have to know how to use it and you still have to have if you're going to make something, some sense of design. So, you know, we've you you certainly saw a lot of cars at the SEMA show that had, you know, like full 3D printed interiors and, you know, all mm-hmm. kinds of custom pieces. And where it's like that's really awesome. There was a lot of them where it's like, yeah, but if if that person knew how to design something, it would be a million times better. <laughs> 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 you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. True. True. And, and talking about the 3D printing, I, I wasn't trying to indicate that it would replace all of the aftermarket sheet metal suppliers out there or that we, w- no, we wouldn't no. use them anymore. But I think there's a definite place for it, especially with hard to find or non reproduced uh, panels where, you know, the, the original is just too beat up to be really be viable. Uh, right. Or something is just not reproduced at all. And uh, you got to. You need to get it somehow, and you, and you know you don't want to spend twenty hours hammering out a, a fender um, when you can just have it made and it's great and it fits. Right, and and I think what this does is it allows you to move the needle forward on your project faster uh-huh. um, because you don't have to do the time of the labor. Now, I'm definitely not naive enough to say that, yes, you're going to open the mailbox and you're going to have a perfect thing uh-huh. because that that's not true either. And there were, there was some backlash. There's people saying, great, now we've got this computer built car and where's the craftsmanship in that? But the reality there is that we're not talking, at least not today. If you look at a, say a deck lid, a deck lid has an outer skin and it's got an uh-huh. inner structure. Sure. So the, the machines we're talking about can make the outer skin and they could make that inner structure, but it's up to you to put them back together. Correct. So that requires somebody who knows how to work metal and cut and weld mm-hmm. and fit and, and do all the stuff. So there's no shortage of those tasks or the demand for the craftsman to put the stuff together. Mm-hmm. It's just getting them better pieces and more imaginative, imaginative pieces and where, you know, where you were saying hard to find stuff, I'm, I'm looking at it as not only that, um, I mean, I see a workflow of, yeah, we're going to scan this fender and no matter what, we're going to have to do some rust repair on screen. So we're going to close up the rust holes and right. repair the, you know, the, the perimeter, but let's make it cool. Let's design something into it. Let's put a little relief in it here or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, imagine, imagine scanning scanning um the the roof skin of a car so scan the whole thing and then drill the 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 roof skin off the car and then scan the substructure 
and then put them both in the software and chop the top on screen. Ooh. Just reshape the skin and the substructure. Yeah. And then s- send it. And then what comes back in the mail is a, a, a chopped substructure that you just spot weld back in and put your skin uh-huh. on it and you, you perform a top chop at all the factory breaks that fits. I mean, it's, yeah, it's amazing when you start thinking about the possibilities. Well, yeah. And also par- part of the craftsmanship is, is in the design is on that computer 100%. screen that, that yeah. takes real talent 100%. to pull off nicely. So it's not that you're losing the craftsmanship. It's just it's shifting a little bit over to a different medium, which is yes. fine. I mean, things things progress. Technology advances, and and we need to be able to embrace it and take advantage of it and make it work for us. Yes. Yeah, and that's the thing. And I remember in the 80s, you know, when, when desktop publishing became a thing, and the newspapers and the magazines of the world were all nervous because they're like, oh, my gosh, with this mm-hmm. Macintosh computer and a laser printer, just anybody could publish a paper or a book. And yes, yeah. but How about that? who could write? Who could write? That was the problem. Right. You, know, <laughs> exactly. you still need somebody that can tell the story and, and write. And in our case, we still need people that can create imaginative designs that make sense that are doable that look good and then let the tools do their thing you know same yes. way yeah unless you know how to use it everything's a hammer right so. right <laughs> and but so the other cool thing there is uh if you really want to hit the ground running a lot of the trade schools are graduating people by the droves that have these these cad skills mm. um 3d design skills and if you you know here's the hot pro tip secret of today if you want to get into this you rent a scanner or you hire a freelancer who owns the scanner comes to your shop scan your stuff have them do the the digital manipulation and and send it you know Uh so you don't have to buy all the stuff there's people out there that do this and um Hmm. and i think it's great you know the, the more the better uh i'm not trying to hoard this secret of of magic you know for us i want i want everybody to do it you know because it it just it's going to allow for more and more cool stuff to get out there which is going to grow the enthusiasm and the hobby and Mm -hmm. and the whole thing so but that was pretty cool because we're seeing a lot of um again vocational technology it and design students that are being released into the world that are enthusiasts that are looking for a place to use their talents, and, and now here's a whole new opportunity for them. Yeah, that's super cool. I mean, it's ah, it's a great industry. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. So that was totally the same uh, overall game changer of this show. You and I got the same juice out of that. Cause, oh, uh, yeah. 100%. That's a thing. <laughs> yeah, that was great. When I saw that, I'm like, holy cat, you're kidding me. Yeah. That is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it really is. Uh, yeah, we got to get on board with this. So, Already yeah. uh, climbing aboard. Nice. Woo woo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, in addition to that, what was the, uh, the the rest of the overall feel of the show that you gathered this year? Um, there's certainly, uh, from my last show, the, the, the attendance was up, I believe. There was a lot of people there. Yeah. Um, the the travel ban has certainly been lifted from the far east, um, so there there was a lot of um, there was a big Chinese contingent there selling their wares that w- wasn't there before due to the travel ban. So that I mean that helps everybody. Um, it's just I mean it's the whole thing is just it's a blur and it's a buzz and it's <laughs> it, it's SEMA man. I mean it's it's hard to quantify it, but it's it's just SEMA. Yeah, I think for me, the big shift this year was, even though we just had a nice discussion about manufacturing, essentially, and, and products and cars, this this year, more than any, was like all about the people for me. Right on. In so many ways. And not just the annual reunion, which is wonderful, too, to see your friends and mm-hmm. you know meet, meet people, but really... I guess as my, you know, mindset has evolved and, and, uh, you know, if you want to call it growth or perspective change or whatever, but I approached a lot of business owners and, and people that run 
large groups of people and leaders um, and talk to them about those situations more than I did about their latest product. And nice. it was, it was really cool. Um, so Jeff Leonard, who, who owns uh, classic industries, known him for a long time, good friend of mine and uh, went over to his display and they've got all kinds of new pro- products there. They got, you know, emblems and badges and restoration pieces uh-huh. and sheet metal and you got reggie jackson's car there reggie was there as a matter of fact standing right there when i was talking with him. oh cool yeah it's good to see uh mr october again yeah man but, uh um but i ended up talking to jeff more about situations that come up during the day when working with a team of people and working with customers and working with suppliers and vendors and manufacturers and navigating this in everybody's best best interest to get the best possible results and keeping the momentum going forward and keeping people focused and and getting outcomes that you want. And we talked for 20, probably 25 minutes. And wow. he shared so much um, of his experience. And, he, you know, the, he, he owns multiple companies. I mean, this guy's a titan of the industry for sure. Yeah. And, and when we got done, I said, look, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, you know, bother you with this stuff. And, and he thanked me. He's like, no, man, this was I, I really appreciate that you reached out and asked me this stuff uh, because it it lended some, you know, credibility to, to what he's been doing. Um, but he was moving into a mentor role for me at that point. And Ooh, nice. that was really cool. Yeah. And, and mentoring is it's an interesting thing because sometimes you don't know if, if and when it's happening. You know, somebody <laughs> with experience shares something with you. Well, guess what? They're kind of mentoring you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of us go through life trying to prove everything on our own. I don't need any help. I can do this. I can figure it out. Uh, but when you let the guard down and look at somebody who's already done it and probably done it a hundred different ways and say, hey, man, what do you think about this? And if they're a solid person and they say, oh, I'm happy to share some experiences with you, that happens when you give them the courtesy and respect of actually listening to them and and learning instead of saying, oh, no, I know how to do this, you know, whatever. Right. So it was just kind of a nice uh, a special thing that occurred where I was, you know, guard was down i'm looking for some insight and he recognized that and saw i was being sincere and shared and i took that to heart and he was he felt good about sharing that that i wasn't going to waste his time or right. n- uh, squander his experiences if you will sure and it was solid man i i walked away like this is th- this is what this stuff is all about you know it was it was really something. It was a, it was a very powerful show for me this year because that happened a that few times. That is killer. Yeah. That is awesome. That is a SEMA moment right there, ladies and gentlemen. It was. <laughs> yeah, it really was. <laughs> that's really, really was. killer. I, I, honestly, sincerely, that's that's fantastic when you can get that. I mean, you've been you've been in this industry for a long, long time, and you know quite a bit. And it's probably you probably on a daily basis don't run into people who can you know, do that for you. But it's great that there's still a place where that can happen for you, where you can still feel like, yes, I'm grow. I, I can still grow. I can still learn. That's, that's important to a lot of people. And I'm glad you, that you get to experience that still. Well, yeah. And I appreciate that. And I think some, some filters had to be removed. Like, like I couldn't be a car guy in that moment as much as I mm-hmm. wanted to check out the stuff. That's not what this was you know what it was all about Uh and i learn from people every single day um some people though have like (laughs) they know all the lessons (laughs) (laughs) some people have a nugget (laughs) some people have an anecdote and some people have like all of it and he's one of those guys who has so many things he's accomplished so many things that i you know either I guess aspire to or would love to try or want to know about or whatever. And, um, he was gracious enough to share that stuff. So yeah, it was, uh, it was something else. And Kelly does this every day, by the way. I mean, she, she just has the ability to, to talk with people and kind of find out what, what they're all about and ask them straight up, you know, how do oh, I do yeah. this? How did you, how did you do this? And, 
In fact, in my conversation with <laughs> with, with Mr. Leonard, um, he offered to hire Kelly like seven times. <laughs> 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 that's awesome i love it i love it everybody wants a piece him, of kelly well i kept telling him you know he was asking what we're doing and how we're doing stuff and i'd be like well kelly's doing this and then he'd be like yeah so does she need a job does, you know, does she... <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry no <laughs> no absolutely not so and i guess in a in a major way that that experience and those type of experiences really helped me feel connected to the industry um, more than just a person who uses products or is enthusiastic about them, you know, to really mm-hmm. kind of get into some of that fiber of, of the people that are making it happen and, and doing, doing big things by a lot of people. Right so, now, nothing happens without the people. So that's great. That's right. Yeah. Nice. So it was cool. Good deal, and man. 58, right 58 million other things happened that week, too. You know, <laughs> like I was saying before, well, you, there's just. Well, you were interviewing quite a few people this week, uh, that week, weren't you? Yeah. Very fortunate, again, to, to be able to do the, the Monday night reveal and, um, you know, do some interviews on stage, do the SEMA Central stage all week and, uh, and interview people there. And, uh-huh. and it's funny because, you know, my interview <laughs> to me. I almost kind of, I almost kind of step out of the, out of the the scene, and it's like I'm watching this on TV myself. Oh, nice! That's kind of how I feel, you know, because a lot of these people that they they schedule for interviews have a lot to say, so you just kind of get them going, and then step back and just you know, enjoy the show and appreciate the the time. So uh-huh. between Antron Brown again was awesome as usual. Yeah. Um, Ant Anstead with his story mm-hmm. of uh, him and Tanner Faust and their team doing the Pikes Peak run. Oh, right. Um, yeah. So that was, it's a long story. He, he, him and Tanner Faust were the, the headliners at the kickoff breakfast. Um, right. About this story of in 100 days, they built a Radford uh, uh, race car to do Pikes Peak. And it's a great story. They told it in eleven minutes, I think, at the uh-huh. uh, at the breakfast. Well, I had Anstead on stage for twenty four. Oh, really? Yeah, that was my single longest interview I've ever done at SEMA. Was with him wow. telling that story in far greater detail. Sure, because uh, I just wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we all. I God, I wish I could have seen that, but I was busy forging relationships, sir. Right, working. <laughs> <laughs> I was effectively watching television. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we all have our job, so good on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that it that story is great. Um, there, there will be a video or a documentary. They shot one. It doesn't have a home yet. I don't know. You can't go watch it on Netflix today yet uh-huh. at some point. But um, Anstead was scheduled for like. 10 minutes and uh oh wow if that and when we got finished uh, our floor director bob said uh hey congrats i said what he's like that's the longest one i think that's ever been done i said how long was it he's like 24 minutes i'm like you're kidding me wow so i, I went over to anstead and i go dude look uh, i i apologize he said for what i said i didn't i didn't mean to monopolize your morning here and he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, that was 24 minutes long. He goes, it was? <laughs> said, yeah. Right on. And he's like, well, it certainly didn't feel like it. Uh, but now I'm late. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. You know, <laughs> right on. So, that was probably yeah. making Tess, the floor director, or the, the producer there, crazy. Uh, well, she was in it, though. She was watching. Everybody was just kind of wa- you know listening and, and just kind of digging that story. Nice. So, that that but, was a pretty cool story. It's a pretty cool looking car, too. Yes. And... and it, there are elements of this story that to make it go a very, very, you know, super short abridged version, Ant Anstead has been associated with the Radford Motor Car Company for a while, building supercars for the street. And uh-huh. they're high end exotic supercars, but they wanted to do something different. So they decided to build one to run Pikes Peak and have Tanner Faust drive it. And the caveat is they had a hundred days to do it. 
and they didn't know what they were doing because uh, the, the Pikes Peak, a race car for Pikes Peak is very different from a road going, you know, supercar. Sure. So they tapped SEMA, the organization, to connect them with people around the world that are experts in different fields. So suspension design and telemetry and you know they so they started with a car that they thought they could modify and ended up scrapping the whole thing and basically building a new one and wow at one point getting back to the technology that we were just talking about i think they had cad drawings of the car in like six different countries with pieces being made all over the world Oh, man. Uh, Using various techniques. So some are being machined on a five axis somewhere. You know, he had 3D printing job shops burning all over the U.S. making stuff. And they had, you know, carbon fiber autoclaves coming together. And then all the parts got shipped to England for assembly. And then they had like a couple days basically to drive the car. And Tanner, of course, you know how it is. You can't put a car together and say, yeah, this is ready to go. So Tanner drives it and he's like, well, we got to change the spring rates and, you know, brake bias and all the things uh-huh. to dial in a, a race car. And I, th- I don't know, he had like less than a hundred miles on it and it was time to race, time to go to Pikes Peak. And then they ran oh, the course brother. and not only did they finish, um, but they finished with a great time that actually ended up setting a class record. So yeah, that is amazing. It's so amazing because it's a small scale version of, you know, the moon landing because it's all these uh, different people that don't know each other all over the world coming together through engineering and design and yep. determination to do something that really hadn't been done by them anyway. And not only did they do it, but they kicked ass. It was great. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. I, I had the, it's funny. I had the exact same analogy in my head <laughs> about mm-hmm. the, about this regarding the moon landing that's crazy right you have all all these different vendors that built all these different components of the rocket and they all had to fit together and and everything worked it's it's amazing yeah and they didn't have a you know an open checkbook courtesy of the u.s treasury department you know right rocks. but somehow they made it work so yeah that was another great experience for me to be able to hear that story firsthand and ask questions along the way about how they did Uh certain things. And, and next thing you know, darn near a half hour flies by and we're like, Whoa, (laughs) Oh man. Um, That's, I mean, sometimes you just get lost in it. You got to go with it. So no worries. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I didn't get any trouble. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, But those, those SEMA central interviews were recorded again. And um, I'm, I'm working with them to try to, get my hands on the footage to be able to edit that and release those through SEMA um, uh-huh. somehow. So I'm in communication because that's definitely one that needs to get out. Um, and then uh, Tim Tebow was another guest. And Tebow is, uh, he's not necessarily the the world's biggest car guy. You'd be like, why is this guy at the SEMA show? Because he, he doesn't, he's not a race car driver or, a, you uh-huh. know, Bill, he's an NFL football player and, and entrepreneur. But what he brought was, again, that unbelievable leadership skill to put a team together to get everybody on the uh-huh. same uh, playbook and execute under insane amounts of pressure and scrutiny with, you know, 100,000 fans in the stands plus millions watching and be successful at it and that conversation was all about how do you align everybody and and make this all happen and it was uh it was great it was really cool to to hear what he what he had to say and he admitted that one of his problems is even though he's this you know superstar athlete and he's you know insanely capable his personality requires being liked so it was hard for him at times to to get on people to to get what he wanted because he was afraid that you know they weren't going to like him and they'd leave or they would they just wouldn't respond somehow. Huh. So he had to learn how to get around all that. Uh, Interesting. And he talked about that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, so we all have our things, you know. At the end of the day, we're all human and we all have the same kind of concerns inside. It's just how do you how do you work them? How do you make them work? Yeah, really? Huh. How did he make them work? He ended up spending time and learning each individual person's 
personality that he worked with on the team. And, and he had to kind of learn how each person, what, what their, you know, um, mode of operation was, what their personality type was, what they responded to, how they could be motivated okay. and then work with them in, in those capacities. And, uh, you know, the, the example that I use was, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, of course, one of my go-tos for anything uh-huh. leadership or skills based because the guy was the best, but Jordan was a jerk, you know, un- under intense pressure. If somebody screwed something up, he let them know it, you know, and demanded, right. uh, their best performance. And, you know, what ended up happening? Well, they won six championships. I mean, it worked. Was it the best thing for interpersonal relationships? Mm, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it got results. And yeah, exactly. All, all throughout history, we have, you know, drill sergeants and we have those abusive managers and leaders and people that are just jerks that get results. And Tebow uh-huh. didn't want to be the jerk that got results. He wanted to be the guy that people liked and got results. I um, uh, gotcha. Which I think is what our future should be. I mean, you should never have to be a jerk to anybody. Even if you get mad, if you can express why you got mad, maybe that person, you're going to get mad together, realizing that you missed the goal, and let's focus that energy on reaching the goal instead of berating the person that you think detracted from the achievement. You know? I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. No, I, I, no, I get it 100%. I mean, it's, it boils down to you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Yeah, right. And, and you don't have to be Mr. Nice Guy all the time, and you're right. not being a pushover. You got to lay your expectations out, and, and you got to be, you got to stick to it. But if everybody knows what they're supposed to, what they're trying to, to achieve, uh-huh. then it's going to be an easier, easier way to get there. Not that you're not going to get let down or, Somebody's not going to get upset or whatever. But again, yeah. this was this was my SEMA show. You know, it was that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, you know, it was a lot different from people online saying, oh, I saw a truck with a Bluetooth drive shaft, man. That's BS. You know? <laughs> they were you, such idiots. I saw some of that it. too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> you're missing the point of the, of the thing. <laughs> right. Exactly. <clears throat> which by the way that whole, show, dri- that whole bluetooth drive shaft thing where that that actually came from is that uh uh-huh. and for those who aren't, aren't familiar with what i'm talking about you see these giant lifted trucks that are four-wheel drive but the front drive shafts removed and people who don't know or are jealous or envious of this you know call them out oh you don't know what you're doing and the first thing i say is they just built this giant off-road vehicle I think they know what a drive shaft is. <laughs> yeah. Right? 100%. I'm pretty sure they know what that part is. So there has to be a reason. And the the organization that does the logistics of the show and and the convention center itself have regulations. There's this big thing you got to read and sign if you're going to have a vehicle on display there. And one of them is that you cannot have anything running in the building at all. So you cannot drive that. 7,500 pound, that 10,000 pound off-road vehicle to a display in the building or on the campus. It has to be pushed. Oh my. And when you have both drive shafts connected, even in neutral, you're adding to that push effort. Yeah. It's a bit of drag on there. Big time. So they would disconnect the front drive shaft so that they could get it into its spot a little bit easier. Not only that, in in case of the need for a rapid egress, you know, if something happened and they had to move that vehicle quickly, um, the drive shaft stays out of it until the end of the show so that, you know, they're not putting it back in or taking it out under uh-huh. stress, under a situation. So that that's where that all started from. And uh, and people just that that story never gets told. So people just think, oh, yeah, these idiots build these trucks and, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, know. I, I giggle a little bit when i when i read that oh my yeah. goodness that so is funny that that show really is um you know from the the bottom scrapings of the ground up to the a universal high level it encompasses everything not just 
cars, trucks, parts, sales, warehousing, shipping, you know, design. It, it's a, uh-huh. it's a, it's a metaphor for every position that you could be in in your life. You know, uh, as somebody entering yeah. an industry to somebody who's been a veteran and all the steps in between about how to be successful or not and different types of jobs and careers and personalities. So it's a lot. It's a, it is a lot. lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, this SEMO is so much more than what I thought it was going to be the first time I went. And it, it, it continues to, to, teach me things and, and, and blow my mind and make me so grateful that, that I'm in this industry now for realsies. And uh, it's just, it's it, nothing like that. I've never been associated with an industry quite like this. I mean, with the vastness of it, the the networking that's available in there, the, the people you meet, I mean, it's, it's a whole different ball game. It's definitely better than a insurance convention, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the bottom line is that it's a passion based industry. So uh, we were looking at the numbers, and you're right. There was somewhere around 160 thousand people from 140 different countries. You know, Man. like 20 2200 exhibitors, I think. Uh, uh, 1100 new products. Uh, no, more than that. Oh, 2000 new products. 1100 feature vehicles, I think, from end to end. So the numbers are staggering. Just how big it is. Uh-huh. And if you think of all the cultures, so 140 countries, everybody's got a slightly different culture and yep. uh, language barriers and, and customs and all this stuff. But the one thing that they all have in common is some kind of passion for cars and trucks, you know. Uh-huh. So there's a bond, even though you mentioned people coming from China or from uh, from Germany or from Italy or from England or Australia or Iowa or uh-huh. Texas. It doesn't matter. Um, there's that, that subtext that, yeah, we, we get along already, you know, we don't know right. each other and we're different, but we already have that thing in common, which just kind of eases. It, it makes it exciting. You know, it does a hundred percent. Yeah, I heard a lot of non-English speaking going on there. I'm like, okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of people from a lot of different places here. This is yeah, this is great. This is what this is what we're supposed to be doing. So it's uh, it's good stuff. And I really love that that perspective that a lot of people that come here from different countries bring with them. They bring a reverence for the event that a lot of Americans don't have because uh, we're we might be too close to it or whatever, but you get people that were like, you know, I've been working for 20 years to try to get to this event from my country and I've heard all these things and it's so much better than what I thought. And it just, you know, super gracious. And, you know, and then, and then you've got other people who take it for granted and it's, it's a letdown. Uh-huh. Those are the Bluetooth drive shaft people again. You know, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. like, dude, <laughs> you, the Bluetooth shaft gang. In full force you on the interwebs, right? You don't you don't get what the, what this really means. <laughs> so I'm just uh, super fortunate to be able to not only go but also work with you know the organization and be a little little tiny part of that show. Um, I don't take that for granted. It's uh, it's something special. Agreed. Yeah. So you know what else is special? <laughs> <laughs> Our lame ass trivia guess. questions. <laughs> <laughs> so See, there's, special. There's room, there's room for all of it in the <laughs> wide world of automotive fun. <laughs> yeah. The dizzying highs, the staggering lows. <laughs> yes. All right. So here we go. All right. So I asked you, Kevin. In 1958, when Chrysler debuted their cruise control system, what did they call it? And you gave me something about throttle command or road command or street command. Or I would have accepted any of those if, if it had the word command in it. However, the trade name that uh, that Chrysler used, and this term has come full circle now with our friends at Tesla, they called it autopilot. Ah, man. Autopilot, sir. Autopilot. Uh, even you know, the, so the thought crossed my mind, um, but I had thought that 
there were even lawyers back then. I guess they just weren't quite quite as sue happy because today's Tesla autopilot thing is far more of an autopilot than just a cruise control, right? Correct. It's self-driving, uh-huh. autonomous nonsense. Huh. Very interesting. Great question. Well, man. I mean, that that goes in, in turn with the future view headlights. I mean, you can't really see into the future with these headlights. I'm going to sue you. Well, yeah, I can see something before I'm there. So that's the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to claim to to be brilliant to use a bad pun but i thought that was a good name for headlights <laughs> <laughs> it is a good name for headlights like from the, from the 50s yeah it, it, it really is it really is and, and i'm i'm kind of surprised that that it hasn't been used but uh, <laughs> but when you when you build your fictional car you can call a future view headlights i will do that right all on. right so um i gave you a really challenging question. Oh, Who did. was a different kind of car company with a different kind of car? And you uh, kind of went right to it and uh, gave me uh, an astronomy lesson and landed <laughs> landed on Saturn. Ooh, uh, how about which was that? 100% correct. Woohoo! Uh, ding, 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 course. ding, ding. Yeah. And I think Saturn. Well, that has been a while since I had a correct question. Holy cow. Well, with authority, too. That was. That was yeah fully uh, yeah. right um yeah it wasn't even a gimme saturn tried to be innovative and different i think in the beginning and then i think that i think the other gm brands kind of started absorbing or catching up or adopting some of the things that saturn was doing uh and eventually they were kind of the same as your small chevrolets and the geo line and just thing that's my observation and they kind of lost their lost their brand identity and Uh they went away but there you go yeah my wife uh jenny was driving a saturn when i first met her that was her car different kind of girl and a different kind of different kind of gal she was Mm -hmm. a gal for me there you go well you're you're a little different too You, sir, are not wrong about that. <laughs> uh, that's why you keep me around. <laughs> that is. That's that's exactly why. If you were the same, then it wouldn't be the same. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, this was fun. It was a, a little bit of a different direction than I thought, but it was good. Um, yeah, it's always great, free flow with us. Yeah, great stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can look forward as a listener, of course, hitting that subscribe button and um, and catching all these episodes as they come out. But uh, our next adventure, you know, the, the hits keep coming, is the Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals, in mm-hmm. which, uh, as we record this, we'll be there tomorrow. And um, oh boy. Recording. An episode there like we like to do. We'll mm-hmm. see if we can, uh, you know, abscond with another table and chair from our friends at Meekum again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be banned by Meekum. <laughs> see if they'll kick us out again. Right. <laughs> Guys, hey, we, really need, <laughs> we really need the table. We really need the table. So lots of stories from that event, as always. And uh, you can... Subscribe and automatically tune in when we release that episode. So, right on. That's it, man. That is all right. Well, that is definitely not all I have on the subject of the SEMA show, but it's all we have time for right now. Oh, boy. Okay. uh, Tune in next time. Yeah. Yeah. McCacken and then more. Who knows? And then the PRI show after that. So, oh, yeah. That's right. A lot. And I I will say um, here's another little teaser. At the PRI show this year, we have a stage presence. Um, they're setting up a, uh, a media stage, if you will, with PAs and audio and stuff. And we have a time slot on Friday from 11.30 to 12.30, I think. Really? And that, that stage is right next to the um, kind of the food court lunch area. So we have a built-in captive audience that's tr- going to try to be eating and we're going to bother them <laughs> with our show. 
hopefully we don't make them lose their appetite. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I, I have a kind of a special episode planned for that one um, because that okay. is going to be the uh, a couple of weeks from the end of the year and also a couple of weeks from the start of a new year. Oh. And that new year is going to mark the 20th year of the V8 TV world. Oh, man. So 2024 is our 20th anniversary of being in business officially. So I think at the PRI show, it's going to be fun to uh, share that story on that stage with yourself and uh, with Kelly. Right on. Right on. Now, 20 years ago, did you, when you first started out, did you ever think it was, this is how it was going to be? No. Not at all. <laughs> I, I hope it's. I hope it's better than what you it's envisioned. Far better. Far more beyond. Good. Better and and in a whole other universe from what I expected. Because honestly, I don't know how much I was expecting. I was just kind of surviving. We're just trying to get through this, right? Uh, day by day, and try and pay the bills and whatever. Um, but luckily, Kelly's a lot smarter than I am, and was able to do a lot of things <laughs> with growth. And uh, and here we are. So yeah, no, I, it's it's been wonderful. So she's very smart, and she is very determined. By very college, much so. so. And and you know, we've recently added some team members, and it's it's it, it's crazy because twenty years ago to me seems like yesterday. But when you bring somebody new into the fold, or a new customer, or whatever, and they ask you, "Hey, how did this get started?" then I know that I'm not doing a good enough job of keeping that story alive and, and top of mind. Uh, Cause I think okay. that's important. So we've, we've covered it here on, on V8 radio in the past to a degree. Yes. Um, but we're going to do it again. And uh, good. more, more will come out that we didn't do before. Uh, oh boy. So yeah, no, it's going to be exciting. And, and this time at the PRI show, we will have a, a live studio audience. Right on. As they eat their burritos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and their chili dogs. <laughs> yeah, right. Their Dave's Famous Barbecue or whatever the heck that is that they, uh, right, they sell, right, sell right. there. So. so, yeah, lots to look forward to, man. Cool, man. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, that's all I got before we go into, you know, this just morphs into a triple episode. Yeah, right. Uh, that's all I got. <laughs> If you uh, enjoyed this, hit that subscribe button. You'll get another episode in the mail soon. And uh, for Mr. Mike Hubal Clark, I'm Kevin Osti, reminding you that uh, although it might seem like something, if you hang around long enough and ask a few questions and dig a little bit deeper, you'll find that uh, there's usually a lot more to the story. And uh, it's one of the reasons why we're here. So thanks for listening to this episode of VA Radio. And uh, keep the shiny side up, and we'll catch you next time.